production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ralph Delarada. I'm uh, the Ohio president for Citizens Bank and proud to say a past president of the City Club's Board of Directors. So it's great to be back home always. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the Most Reverend Nelson J. Perez, Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Cleveland. Bishop Perez was appointed to the 11th to be the 11th Bishop of the Diocese of Cleveland and the first of Hispanic descent in the Midwest. He was appointed by Pope Francis on July 11, 2017, following the resignation of his predecessor, Bishop Richard Lennon. He was formally installed on September 5, 2017. Bishop Perez was born in Miami he was born in Miami to Cuban immigrants and began serving the church at age seven as an altar boy in New Jersey. And he told me this story as we met beforehand. I love it. He was not eligible because he wasn't attending a Catholic school, but through his creativity, he found a way to become an altar boy. So I think that speaks well of his uh, creativity and his initiative. Bishop Perez earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from Montclair State University and he taught at a Catholic elementary school in Puerto Rico prior, prior to entering Philadelphia's St. Charles Borromeo Seminary. There he earned a Master of Arts and a Master of Divinity degree and was ordained by the Archdiocese of Philadelphia in 1989. Throughout his career, Bishop Perez has served as a parish priest, as the Assistant Director of the Office of Hispanic Catholics, the founding director of the Catholic Institute for Evangelization, and a former auxiliary bishop of the Diocese of Rockville Center in New York, diocese I actually grew up very close to, as we traded remarks earlier. The self-described unifier, Bishop Perez is aiming to connect all Catholics, regardless of their ethnicity, their race, or political affiliation. His beliefs have been compared to those of Pope Francis, as is his commitment to being in dialogue with the modern world in his own terms. We'll hear more about his thoughts on this statement today. His arrival in Cleveland has been received positively. According to Cleveland.com's editorial board, Bishop Perez has come into town smiling and talking about the need for joy. He has spent considerable time saying mass at churches across the diocese's eight county region meeting and mingling with his parishioners, which number over 700,000, I believe, along with exploring the city's treasures, including Little Italy and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in a warm welcome uh, in welcoming Bishop Nelson J. Perez. Creativity thing. Uh, since since I didn't, I only went to Catholic school. Uh, I think it was two years, and then the nuns couldn't deal with me. So if they could see me now, <laughs> um, and so I wasn't among the pool of uh, of uh, young men who would be invited to be. Uh, altar service, but, you know, ever since I was a kid, I was always fascinated, uh, actually like mesmerized by everything that happened up around the Catholic altar. You know, while other kids were, uh, you know, messing around in the pews, my eyes were fixated 
uh, on what was happening there. It was very mystical. It was very mysterious. Um, and it just enthralled me completely, captured my imagination. And because of that, I spent a lot of time observing what, what, the, uh, what these guys did and how they did it. And, uh, and I always thought, gee, I, I'd really like to do that, but no one was really asking. And I wasn't in a context where I would be asked anyway. Um, so one day when uh, I said, you know what, I'm just going to have to deal with it. And so I did. When the, uh, when the priest came out with his contingent of uh, altar servers, I walked into <laughs> to the sacristy and, and went to this closet where they had their stuff. And I remember putting a red, it was, they used like a red cassock and a white thing. And I put that on and then made my, went out and went into the altar. And I remember, I'll never forget the look on the priest's face. You know? <laughs> We know what that's like now, right? <laughs> you you want to act cool, calm, and collective. But um, so he, he, he turned to me and he said, and who are you? I said, well, I'm one of your altar servers. And then he said, he was nice enough. He said, well, I guess so. And, <laughs> and that's how I became a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, you don't dress up in these garbs and become a bishop. <laughs> I didn't walk into no room and do that. Uh, thank you so much for your invitation. Thank you for your invitation to come here today. Uh, it's really wonderful to be with you at one of these uh, one, probably oldest, continuous, independent free speech forums in the country. You know, it's, it's unbelievable, a place of great dialogue and exchange. Um, I'm, I'm really, uh, I have to say, I have to be honest with you, I'm very humbled and, and um, to be even standing here in this context where uh, people of the likes of, uh, you know, Babe Ruth, Franklin Roosevelt, Rosa Parks, Robert Kennedy, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, presidents, you know, uh, for you, for you, I'm the Bishop of Cleveland. Right? When I look at myself in the mirror at 5.30 in the morning, I do not see the Bishop of Cleveland. <laughs> Trust me. I just see Nelson. And most of the time, I look at him and I say, man, you should go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very humbling to be here and, and uh, take this time to, uh, to share uh, with you. So I thank you, Dan, for your invitation um, and for your gracious uh, introduction and for all the people who are here, all of you here, I love, I have to say, I love seeing the young people here. You know, thank you for taking the time to be here. You know, uh, oftentimes they say about you that you're like the future. And I don't know, the future, like I'm here now. <laughs> it's like, why am I in the future? You know, so we're very thankful that you're here in the present, you know, uh, to hear uh, your voice. Um, it's an incredible week uh, here in Cleveland today, uh, this week. Uh, lots of things are, are happening. We got the Rock Hall of Fame uh, induction tonight, is it? Tomorrow night? Can I change a confirma confirmation? <laughs> Someone could get me tickets to that, right? I thought you wanted to be inducted. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Um, you know, you got the Cavs and the Indians, I think, playing. It's going to be a busy downtown, isn't it? Right? And then you got the Film Fest going on. Can I get tickets to that and change my schedule, too? <laughs> so lots of things are happening. And, and uh, if I had to say, uh, people ask, what do you think of Cleveland? You know, I get, couple, I get the same questions over and over again, as you would imagine. What do you think of Cleveland? Well, I think of Cleveland, what I said today of... Uh, of the press conference, you know, Cleveland rocks. Look at it, right? Look at this place, it's uh, activities, it's, um, it's all hit, it's different um, uh, activities that are happening, it's people, it's restaurants, it's, it's just unbelievable. And, and another question I get a lot is, well, what, what comes to light? What, what um, 
What do you see? What's distinctive, right? And I have to say, one of the things that's distinctive that I see is, is your, your friendliness. You know, your, uh, the people of Northeast Ohio are profoundly warm and welcoming. Warm and welcoming. While I was um, in, in the Philadelphia area for 30 years, in a lot of ways, I have to say, the, uh, this area of uh, this part of the, of, of the country, this Cleveland and its surrounding areas, uh, feels a lot like Philly. Uh, they say, well, how, what do you think Cleveland is like? It says, well, it's like, it's like Philly without the cheesesteak. <laughs> you know, it's warm, it's friendly, it's ethnic, it's religious and all sorts of expressions of, of the faith. Um, uh, it, it's really friendly. A little different than New York. You guys are New Yorkers. You know, New York is fast-paced and somewhat impersonal at times. And you could go into a New York City subway and all things happen in New York City subways. And no, and no one blinks an eye. No one blinks an eye. But here it's wonderful. I, I do say that, you know, uh, People here drive too slow. Uh, the lights are long. I don't know why it's like, when I drive, why is this light so long? And people don't jaywalk. I have to cross 9th Street to get to my office. And, and I, have, I have to be honest with you, even to this day, I'm like holding on. Not because I fear, because in, in New York, what you do is you, you run across the street around the cars that are moving, <laughs> right? And here, people stand very politely in the corner. It doesn't matter if it's 6 degrees out and 50 mile an hour winds. They stand there until the little green man appears. <laughs> and then they cross. And I stand there thinking, why are they doing that? <laughs> And it's a very generous community. People give of themselves, give them of their treasure, of their time, um, to make the world a better place. That, that's really an amazing, an amazing uh, characteristic of the people of this area of, 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 uh, of Ohio. So it's just so incredibly generous, generous, a very generous heart. Um, I've been here like seven months in this church of Cleveland, the 23rd largest in the country. Did you know that? It's the 23rd largest diocese in the country. There are about 197 dioceses in the country. This is number 23. You know, we're, we're just close to 700,000 uh, Catholics. Um, someone said to me a couple of weeks ago, I said, so, uh, so you're a priest, you know, or a bishop. You don't have any kids. And I said, uh, you can't have kids. And, and I said, well, I beg to differ. And their eyes got like this. I said, what is, what's coming out of this guy's mouth? And I said, well, I have close to 700,000. I have more kids than you do. And so I'm so very grateful uh, to be here in this diocese that's uh, about 170 years old. Lots of parish communities, you know, about 185 parishes, 20 high schools, something like 90, 91 elementary schools, uh, and enormous, enormous Catholic charities. I mean, big. 400,000 people are served every year quietly, sometimes under the radar scope. No one, as we're standing here today, sit, you're sitting there, I'm standing here. Uh, Hundreds of, of charity workers are uh, serving those who are poor and, and need help and for one reason or another in life can't help themselves. That, that is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And for, and for the works of charity in the, in the church, it doesn't matter where you come from. In fact, most of the people they serve are actually not even Catholic. It's not a question that's asked. It's, it's charity. It's love for the sake of charity and love, period. No strings attached. It is what it is. It is part of who we are uh, as, a, as a Christian community. And, and that, to me, um, is a source of great pride as a Christian and as a Catholic of uh, the work that's done day in and day out at all sorts of levels. 
And so in the last seven years, I've been blessed with, uh, seven months, I've been blessed with uh, visiting uh, all sorts of stuff that goes on here. Parishes, schools, universities, um, Catholic charity centers, parishes, schools, universities, uh, Catholic charity centers, and over and over again. And, And I'm just utterly amazed at the generosity of people, the joy of people, and and the love that people have for people. It's palpable, it's palpable, it's, 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 it's something you could touch, you could feel and be touched and feel, you feel it yourself. And so that has been a great blessing. Uh, and, and to see the rich diversity of this local church. You know, diversity isn't new to the Catholic Church. You know, it, is, it really lies at the center of its religious expression. Even the word e- expresses that. The word Catholic comes from a Greek word that means means universal. So it's not really tied to anybody. It's it's the Christian faith that gets dressed up, if you will, uh, by the symbols and signs and customs of a culture and and gets incarnated in in a culture. Um, As as Christ uh, became incarnated in in a time and a place. Right? Uh, in a time and a place. I was talking to Dan, and Dan says to me, well, you know, I'm not Catholic, I'm Jewish. And my response to him was, yeah, well, so is Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was not a Catholic. You know, he was a Jew. And so was Jesus. So in a lot of ways, we Christians, I said to him, uh, kind of are Jews, too, and, because we are, we're all bound together in this, in this wonderful uh, love of the Lord. And and so that, that's seeing that in our schools, parishes, universities, um, in our city is certainly an incredible, uh, an incredible gift to me to see it unfold. Um, one of the things I said uh, at my installation, which really came from my heart, um, was that I, you know, that I didn't come here. Um, I came here to become a part of Cleveland, not the other way around. Right? And that, there's a lot of consequences to that, to that statement. A lot of consequences. You know, because then it has to guide the way I approach things, if I'm going to be true to that. And, um, and I get asked a lot, so what's your plan? What's your vision? What are you going to do? I said, I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> you know, I'm going to see what you do and become a part of that and, and, and then make my own suggestions and bring my own thoughts and, and gifts to that. But, it would be a pretty arrogant on my part to walk into uh, a community, a Catholic community and a city uh, that's been around forever and, and say, here's the plan, do it. You know, that's, that's not playing nice in the sandbox. You know, so I'm thrilled to just allow right now uh, the church and, and the world of Cleveland to kind of unfold, to see it, to learn from it, to ask my questions when I need to, I have no, I have no qualms in saying, "Well, you know what? I'm this. I think we should do that," you know, and, and do it when I need when I need to do it. Um, in in a lot of ways, I see myself as allowing myself to be led, led by you, led by God's Spirit, led by by the history um, and and the legacy of this local church uh, and and city. And so that's where I basically came on September 5th, and that's in a lot of ways where I am. Uh, Pope Francis does give us a, uh, a framework by which to, to think about that, though. And he, and he speaks about a church, which at the same time you could take church out and put city, because I think these words are really powerful. He talks about a church and or a city or the world that needs to take the first initiative on issues, and not just sit back, you know, and, and watch and then complain, right? You know, is take, take the first initiative, you know. You might not be able to solve the world's problems, but you might be able to do something. Take the first initiative. Um, uh, be engaged. Be engaged. You know, Jesus uses these images of engagement, which are, uh, for his time, they were very, um, uh, they were very sort of like, from the earth. And he talks about how uh, we Christians uh, need to be like yeast. 
East is a wonderful image, right? Because you put East in, in flower, and what does it do? It just it makes it rise. It doesn't explode it, right? It just makes it rise. It's the nature of, of yeast and, and says, well, that's how uh, we should be in the world, right? Engage in the life of the world and dialogue with, uh, with, the, with the world and each bringing to the world our vision and our thoughts and, and, uh, and our reality and enriching each other with, in, in that dialogue. It's a church that, that is, that accompanies. You know, accompaniment is a word that Francis uses a lot, right? To accompany people, um, to walk with them, right? To walk with them, which is such a biblical image, right? The Old Testament sees God accompanying uh, the chosen people, walks with them in their history, in their time, in their moments, in, in their... Uh, in, in, in the dilemma and the drama of life. And then uh, for us Christians, that God became man and took the form of man. And this Jesus of Nazareth entered, not only uh, walked, but then enters time and history and walks with us and walks with us. And, and so there's the church as well, you know, through its people, through its faithful, whether they're ordained or not, is the church the Christian world uh, walking with the world and in dialogue with the world, engaging the world. He talks about how the world and how the church and the world is to be fruitful. You know, we want to be fruitful. We want to be successful. That's a good thing. You know, being ambitious in a positive, uh, wholesome way is actually good. Wanting to be happy is rooted in who we are, right? No one wakes, in the, wakes up in the morning and says, I hope that today I have an absolutely miserable day, right? Now, it might happen that you have a miserable day, but that's not what we hope for, right? We hope that, our, that the work of our day and the, and the, will be fruitful, that our labor will be fruitful in producing uh, good stuff in the world. And finally, to be joyful. He talks about um, so much uh, the gift of joy that's rooted in, in being a person of faith, right? And being a person of faith and says that, and, he, and, and, he, and it's a great message that he gives to the world. Our joy is not rooted on whether things go well or not. On any given day, things might go south, right? They do, they do, they do right? You know, they do. You know, today you got an A on the exam, tomorrow you might get a C. Deal with it. You know? <laughs> Study more, you know? Um, when I was in college, I, I, was, I had to take a physics exam, but I got distracted and, and didn't study for it. So on the way to school, I had a little VW, um, a Volkswagen. You know, it had 130,000 miles. Those cars were unbelievable. And I remember driving to the university uh, knowing that I had to take this physics exam. And, and then I resorted to prayer. <laughs> because I couldn't read in the car. <laughs> so I took out my rosaries and I'm praying and praying and praying and praying. And, and then I said this really elaborate prayer to God about how you know, you are, you are the one who are the source of all knowledge, and you create. It was a great prayer, I have to say. I took the exam, and I failed. And what I learned from that experience is that what I needed to do to pass the exam was not actually pray. Study would have helped. You know? Study would have helped. And so I'm in the process of studying this area and see how we could together be a, a community that, that, um, that, that does take the first initiative, that is engaged, that accompanies, that is fruitful, that is joyful, inside the church and outside the church at the same time, and setting that type of tone. As we deal with issues, right? Every period has its issues. You know, there's, a, there's not a week that goes by that we don't... Um, that unfortunately we don't see acts of violence 
You know, there's not a day that goes by that we don't put the news on and say, whoop, whoop look what happened again. Look what happened again. Violence, you know, it's, it's plagued humanity forever. Not new to us now, not exclusive to us. It has placed, you plagued humanity forever. How do we call people to peace and nonviolence? You know, and we just celebrated Martin Luther King's uh, being the victim of violence, right? The, 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 the prophet of, of peace. This man was an incredible prophet of peace, calling for peaceful demonstration to raise our voices to the injustices of the world and society, but in a peaceful way, right? And he himself has to succumb to, to an act of violence, right? To an act of violence. Uh, but you know, at the end, especially from this Christian perspective, the story didn't end there, right? Right, because they, they might have killed him, but they actually made him more powerful. Wasn't that incredible? They made this guy, if they really wanted to, to snuff him out, they should have just left him alone, right? But they, they unleashed, right? Though they might have killed his body, what they did was they unleashed the power of what was in his mind and in his heart to the world. You know, it's like this guy now has become, he wasn't just now, he wasn't just Martin Luther King, the reverend and the doctor back then. He became an icon, you know, an icon. The violence we got to deal with and, and the opiate stuff that's happening now, it's sad, right? You know, it's sad. We got to pray for that. We got to work together to see how we're going to deal with that stuff and and how difficult it is today with the issues of immigration, right? You know, I was in a conference many years ago, um, and there was such a negative, com uh, and someone got up and asked the question, "Why is this happening?" And the and the person who was giving the the presenter at this conference kind of said his response was very simple, it says because we forget where we came from. We, for, we have forgotten. We have really short-term memory. We have forgotten where we came from. And so we have to pray for that and, and help make that, uh, make, that, make that happen. So I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, it's 1 o'clock, so I have to uh, move on, and I want to hear from you guys. But thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to stand here and be with you today. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here at the City Club, and today we're enjoying a forum with the Most Reverend Nelson J. Perez, Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Cleveland. We're about to begin the Q&A with all of you. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast or our webcast. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today, our membership and customer service manager, Corey Isler, and content coordinator, Bliss Davis. May we have our first question, please. Uh, Bishop, you're a breath of fresh air. Thank you. Thank Welcome you. to the City Club. Um, Bishop, does the president's uh, behavior toward um, the downtrodden immigrants, the poor, and toward women, uh, does it uh, strike you as consistent with core Christian beliefs, and I'm thinking of the Beatitudes, mm -hmm. as I was taught at Ignatius. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you are you surprised or upset at the apparent support that the president gets from the white evangelical community? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a loaded question or why? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the question, the you know, without getting into uh, into politics or issues of personality and stuff like that, just on the surface, right? The uh, the um, the Judeo Christian ethic, as as um, presented to us in, in for us people of faith in the Scriptures, uh, does call us to a profound respect of each other, you know, and and of diversity and. And uh, respect to the dignity that is given to us not by any law or by any state, right? As the Constitution so clearly says, right? It is, it is innate. It comes with the package. 
it's ingrained and, and put in us, and there are certainly challenges at times to that. Um, but we have to go back to what the, um, what the core tenets of our faith uh, call you and I to. You know, what other people do with that, I don't have any control. I do have control over what I do. And I know what the scriptures call me to, right, and call us to, and call us to be poor in spirit, and, and, uh, and call us to, to take care of those who, who are in need. Because as Christ said himself, you know, when you do it to them, you did it to me. Right? We all know that very famous passage, right? I was hungry and you gave me to eat and I was, you know, and he says, and Christ says, this is the criterion by which you will be judged. Right? This is not how many novenas you said. <laughs> this is the criteria. The novenas are there to help you do that. Right? This is, this is, how, this is the criteria of what it means at the core to encounter the living Christ. Uh, and he chose, he did it, I didn't. He did it, I just have to follow obediently. He chose to unite himself um, to those in need. To those in need. Thank you. Next question. Yes, okay. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Gwen Stembridge, and Hi, I Gwen. am so grateful that you're here. So glad. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, what does it look like to build bridges and be in dialogue with the modern world when members of the LGBTQ community hear messages that mm -hmm. their authenticity is mm -hmm. unwelcome in the church? Mm -hmm. Definitely, the, uh, the church and people of faith, of any faith, are going to have their core set of values, right? as people in other communities have in themselves. And, um, and so I think what's challenging uh, for the Christian world today is how do we meet people where they are and at the same time be respectful of our own core values too, right? And at some point be able to live with that, right? Because we don't agree with everybody in our lives, right? Right? There are people in our families at times that... We don't agree with, but we, we never say you're not in the family, right? That you're still in the house, that you're still in the house. And I think the church, uh, and, and beyond the Catholic church, I think the, the, even the world of faith is trying to learn, you know, what does it mean uh, to walk together? And, and that's, I think, what Pope Francis is talking about when he talks about that wonderful word, accompaniment. A company doesn't necessarily mean that you become me and I become you. It means that I am who I am and you are who you are, and somehow we love each other and take care of each other. Next, yes? Hello, Bishop, and welcome to Cleveland. My name is Wally McGilvray, and I really don't have a question. I have more of a statement. Um, there's a Christian song out right now uh, where the artist asks God, why are people, children dying? Why are people hungry? Why are people fighting? And the answer to his question comes from God as, I made you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it's all about. It all starts with community. It all starts with people. Mm -hmm. And the basic thing is, it comes down to people need the Lord. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Um, the bishops have been somewhat quiet, it seems, in terms of national political agenda and policy formation. Uh, what do you see as your role in helping the bishops themselves as an organization to become uh, more active politically? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, would, I would honestly, respectfully, a little bit disagree because the, the bishops' conference as a body of bishops in the United States is constantly making statements, right? Whether they're picked up by the media and you hear them, that's another issue, right? Uh, that's another issue. And that's the, the, the bishops can't control what the media chooses to put on their newscast, right, that has the widest. But uh, there isn't a day on any issue, on any issue um, that... Um, that the, that the bishops of the country don't make a very clear statement. Uh, the bishops as a body are not really interested in politics, though, right? Uh, the bishops recognize that we live in a political world in the best sense 
right, of the word, not in the negative sense, but in the best sense of the word. As a, as a body of bishops, uh, the bishops, it's not about politics. It's about protecting human life. It's about protecting and promoting the dignity of the human person. It's about protecting family. Uh, it's about being a voice uh, for those who don't have a voice, right? That is where the where the the bishops will engage at that level, at that and because of that, not because of one political ideology or another. In a sense, the the church is not interested in it that way. Remember, the church is over two thousand years old. Has a lot of gray hair, lots, a lot more than I do, you know. And and is and it's danced through history with the best of politicians and world leaders. And, uh, and so the Christian world as a whole, I think Catholic and Protestant, all of us together, we only engage that world, but within a context, right? Not for political reasons in, the, in, in that sense, but for humanitarian and, and Christian reasons to, to give voice in particular to those who have no voice and make sure that, that life and human dignity uh, are respected. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Uh, I was raised Catholic, but I've been a lapsed Catholic for many years, uh, much to my 90-year-old mother's chagrin. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you speak to lapsed Catholics all the time. What do you say to lapsed Catholics to encourage them to return to the church? That you never left. <laughs> right? That you never left, that, that you might need to re-engage at certain levels, but you never left. I was a lapsed Catholic at one point, and I became a bishop. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that you never left. And, to, uh, and then I would say then work it out for your own sense of peace in your own soul. Hello. Um, I have a question. Um, recently, I've been doing a lot of reading and listening about leadership and just understanding how to handle so much that's going on in your world, work, life. And I just want to understand from your perspective, for people that are young and up and coming, what kind of advice do you give on how to handle stress, all the to-dos, having a life, enjoying it, and just, you know, making a difference? Mm -hmm. Wow. Are you free till four? Yeah. I would say, if anything, I would say balance. Balance, right? Balance with extremes. With ex extremes are a bad place to be at any area of life. Extremes are not a good place to be. Um, and in, lo in a lot of ways, um, there are extremes that we crawl into, you know, uh, like, I'm going to change the world. Really? <laughs> wow. Good luck. Right? The other extreme is, I'm going to do nothing. Right? That's another extreme, and that's unhealthy. And, and you know what? Uh, extremes always somewhere along the line meet. And neither extreme at the end ends up doing nothing. They end up doing nothing, actually. Right? So balance. Balance. Uh, with uh, we do what we can and we don't do what we can because it is what it is you know so uh, let me let me uh, respond to you with uh, with an experience in the first couple of years of my ordination to the priest one of the things that the priest does is preaches the word right and you would hope that that word you know would be effective in people's lives right and so uh, I was asked a question of four or five years later into, the, into the, the world of being a preacher, uh, do you think people are actually listening to when you talk? <laughs> right? Well, initially, my answer was, well, I sure hope so, right? Because that's where I receive like, validation, right? That people are listening, right? Eventually, then I realized that, and my answer then became, 
I don't know. And in some ways, I almost don't care. Because it's, not everything's up to me. Right? And I have to realize that not everything is up to me. And that I'm doing my part. What was my part? I got up in the morning and stood behind that altar. And on May 20th of 1989, I went and gave my life to the service of the church and the world. And in that context, I do what I can, right? But I'm not the Savior. The Savior came and left, and it wasn't me. But he works through all of us collectively, right? He works through all of us collectively. Uh, G Jesus had some things to say about that, right? He said, um, the farmer goes out, the sower goes out, and he sows the seed. He said, this is what the kingdom of, like, of God is like. The, king, the sower goes out and he sows the seed, and as he sleeps, that seed grows without him knowing how. Right? Someone has to sow the seed. Not because God had to do that, but because he chose to do that. Right? But also know that then the seed, once it is sowed, has a life of its own and will grow on its own. And so balance between the extremes, I think, of, of, uh, of being uh, a apathetic to the world around us, that's not good, right? right? And on the other side of thinking, I'm going to change the world, really. I can't even change mine. Sometimes I can't even change my socks. You know, I'm going to change the world? You know, so it's balance, balance between two extremes and knowing that it includes us, but it's not completely uh, dependent on us either. And that's very freeing. Does that make sense to you? Bishop, welcome to Cleveland. Thank you. Um, we're very pleased to have you here. Um, my question relates to the role of the church um, and the, the way we connect with the church. And it's basically, obviously, within the liturgy. Um, and particularly um, at, at the point where the priest at the pulpit speaks to us, okay? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> to what extent do you believe that your priests, and as a member now of the leadership community of, of Greater Cleveland, mm -hmm. um, how can you influence priests at the pulpit to change the behavior of mm -hmm. Catholics in this mm -hmm. greater Cleveland community, particularly in the suburbs, generally speaking, and no, mm -hmm. no offense to anybody, mm -hmm. but we all know in this room that there's, there are still um, anti-immigrant, lack of empathy, mm -hmm. lack of empathy, um, conversations, you know, at dinner parties or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always somebody in the room who, or many people in the room, who will actually say, you know, that they don't like their tax dollars going to pay for, mm -hmm. you know, poor children or abused women, et cetera, et cetera. So you kind of get the message, I'm sure. I believe strongly that the church, and particularly you as the leader of the priests in this community, mm -hmm. have an obligation to send a very strong message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. To me, it's a matter of witness. It's a matter of tone, right? Early on when I came here, there was a, a poor family, you know. Um, his name, his name was, is uh, Pe Pedro Hernandez, and he was deported, right? I went, to, um, I went and met with the family at uh, his presentation, and he had to present himself at ICE, right? Uh, I didn't go there with press or anything like that. Eventually, somehow, it got leaked out, but it wasn't me at the time, and, and so it, it was a statement on the part, not just of me personally, but of the church's accompaniment, right? Uh, accompaniment of that. Um, and I think setting that tone and that sends a, also a message to the world around us that we need to walk with, with, with our immigrants and our undocumented uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, at a recent meeting, we were, we were all talking, it's a group called Welcoming the Stranger in the Diocese, and we were all talking about uh, what can we do and this and that, and, and I listened to the conversation. At the end, uh, I said, you know, I know what sometimes is not under control. Like, I can't change the law. 
It's not my place to do that. I don't have the power to do that. I can't change that, right? I can't change. I wish I could, but I can't. But what can we do? What can we do? And so we, um, uh, some the conversation started and started and some went around and around, and the idea surfaced of of training uh, a companions, so that when a family is like Pedro's family, right, is uh, confronted with the reality of de deportation, that's beyond what I myself could control, right. What I can control is how I support and help that family to deal with that situation. And, and so we talked about it, and then, I, and then I challenged that group, and I said, uh, well, you have 90 days. Come up with a program. Don't just talk about it. Go and do it, right? And they scrambled, and they did it. And about two weeks ago, they trained 45 companions, legally, socially, in terms of, of supportive counseling, they both, I went to, I met with them, I sat with them. Uh, 45 people came together uh, and they were trained by Catholic charities and lawyers and this and that on how to accompany people in those types of moments. That's setting a tone. That's setting a tone, little by little, right? And then we do what we can, right? And, and trust that God will use that in powerful ways. In powerful ways. Yes. Hi, uh, I go to ACL, and uh, I had a question, kind of about like uh, the Catholic Church and like kind of what the nice lady over there referenced earlier with the idea of like uh, kind of the suburban Catholics and stuff, and uh, you know the problems and just like the issues within the parish around the outer rim of Cleveland stuff. So uh, I go to a Catholic school, and there's a rising thing among kids my age called the uh, pa charismatic movement, and it's based on the Pentecostal uh, Christian section of uh, evangelical America. And uh, when I was on a retreat uh, at, through my school, one of, one of these kids who were with that kind of talked about uh, uh, Catholicism, how it has to start closing down and like uh, enforcing its beliefs stricter. And they're talking about the uh, line from the New Testament where Jesus said, something about uh, spiritual warfare, how there's got to be conflict with uh, faith. And uh, I was just wondering, how do you feel about that, and how can we like address that as a Catholic community with like this kind of wave of new ideas, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have to be honest, I don't like the combative language. You know, I don't like that language of, of is, there a, is, is there a spiritual war? Uh, well, yeah. There is inside of me and inside of you, right? It, Paul talked about it. You know, he talked, talk, Paul talked about kind of that war in the heart, in the spirit. He called it the spirit and the flesh. And he talked about how uh, at times we all go through it, right? We, we, we do what we don't want to do, and, and what we want to do, we don't do, right? And it's over and over again, you know? And, and in each one of our own personal lives and in our hearts, sometimes... We are in battle with ourselves, right? And, and it's like you go like, oh. You know, your, your wants and desires go in this direction and your heart goes in the other one. And, and Paul talks about that struggle. It's not new. And if that happens in the human heart, then it happens in the community of hearts. It happens there, right? And... And there is a struggle at times, you know, in the human heart and in the family of human hearts of, of, the, of the conflict between good and evil, between what's right and wrong and wise and unwise, you know. And that's been picked up over and over again by art and by drama. You know, the, when I was a kid, you're, you're too young to, uh, for Bugs Bunny and all that, but uh, I don't know if you are, but... But it was always a cartoon where you have the little angel here, right? And then the little demon over here. Where is that coming from? It's from this, this um, tension at times that happens. So that is part of the human dilemma, right? Where sometimes we don't do what we want to do, and what we want to do we end up not doing. Nothing new. Nothing new to... And in that, then, that, then lies uh, God's word, 
that says this is the path you should walk. As you're, as you're struggling with those two entities of wise and unwise, good and not good and evil, and he, here's the way. Here's the way. Here's, here's, the, ro- here's the path. Right? And, and to listen to that voice, that here's the path, you know? Listen to the voice of the good shepherd. Now, there are other voices. The voice of the good shepherd is not the only voice in our hearts. There are other voices that also compete, right? But he says, but only one of those voices is the voice of the good shepherd. Only one. Yes, sir. Our next question comes from Twitter. Could you talk about the sin of racism and the church's approach to combating and countering it in modern society? I believe the Bishop of Youngstown heads a USCCB ad hoc committee on racism. You're right, yes, uh, Bishop Murray is, uh, was asked to be the chair of a committee on racism. And, and, and in fact, one of the committees that I'm connected with uh, the, uh, in the, uh, for the Bishop's Conference, the Committee on Cultural Diversity in the Church, is in the process of putting together a letter on racism from the bishops um, to once again address that issue that is so much rooted in, in the dignity of the human person, in the dignity of the human person, that, that our, dignity, our dignity is not rooted in the, well, what did, what did Dr. King say? Not rooted in, in the color of our skin or anything like that, but in the character of our person, right? And in the dignity of our person. That forever is going to be the voice also of the church that, that calls racism a sin and calls it a crime. And that we, we need to... It's almost like the church has been saying uh, what uh, Dr. King has... You know, we got to get this thing out. This is not good for humanity. It is not good for us uh, to go down that route. It is, it is almost like a cancerous tumor. We need to get it out. Bishop, thank you for taking this question. Thank I'm you. Cullen Vonkort from St. Ignatius High School. And I was just curious, sorry, it's not as a political question, but I'm curious, how do you feel about incorporating some of the more obscure rites of the Catholic faith, and then even in a more ecumenical sense, maybe some more of the Judeo-Christian and even Islam into uh, a greater kind of communion just between faiths and giving more universality to the Catholic belief. Mm-hmm. Thank you. In a lot of ways, you know, the Catholic Church in particular since the Second Vatican Council that, that uh, completed in the late 60s, right, uh, in, uh, has, been a, uh, has been a leader in the ecumenical and religious uh, dialogue. In fact, every, every local church, every diocese, actually has an office dedicated to that. It's, in, it's, it's, it's institutionalized and even in its structure. That's how important it is actually for the Catholic Church. Uh, here in the Church of Cleveland, there's been a priest, Father Ozinski, that's been doing that work for what, 20 years? 20 years of being in dialogue and in conversation. And I was really happy to uh, host a gathering, a luncheon, uh, I believe it was in February, I think. Um, everything runs together right now. Uh, and I brought together uh, leaders of all uh, different Christian and interreligious communities. The, the, the Muslims were there uh, and other Christian groups, the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, the Orthodox, the Presbyterians. Uh, we had a great lunch and we uh, committed to each other that we would uh, gather quarterly to talk, just to talk. I, I, I think it's a great thing to gather uh, and talk like we're doing here today. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering with all these great students here today, whether you have any thoughts on how not just the students, but all of us can um, embrace our communities more and be more of a positive influence on mm-hmm. them. I would say be engaged. Be engaged. I, I see things not in this group because I don't know you personally, right? Um, but what do we do with iPhones? We stick it in, in our ear, and then we walk to the beat of our own drum. We have to stop walking to just the beat of our own drum because there are other drums that also need to be heard. So 
I would say be careful to isolate ourselves in the world of, of our music, in the world of our video games. But at the same time, studies are now showing that I don't know if we're as connected as we think we are. It's actually a very lonely place. The world of social media could actually be a very lonely place. Time will tell. But if anything, it's what uh, Francis has called for, right? To be engaged. And to be engaged means that we have to come ha somehow break out of ourselves. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a forum with the Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Cleveland, the Most Reverend Nelson J. Perez. Our forum today is part of our Local Heroes series, which is sponsored by Citizens Bank and Dominion Energy. Our community partner is Metro Catholic School. We appreciate all of you for your support. And that brings us to the end of our program today. Thank you, Bishop Perez. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.